This is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. It was entertaining. I don't think I would buy this game. Everything sort of flowed logically. Game designers from all over the country sent their prototypes to us at Cards Against Humanity. We picked eight finalists, and now we're bringing them to Gen Con, the biggest tabletop gaming convention in the world, where they're going to pitch their prototypes to our panel of industry-leading judges. One game will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be crowned the winner of Tabletop Deathmatch. All right, uh, food. Who has the most food? Our Gen Con has been... Awesome. A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of stuff. Isla with eleven. Tom with fourteen, and I have nine. Oh, I can't so say. I was... Did I win? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> you are clearly the game master today. Yeah. You are the top squire. <laughs> but yeah, and imagine doing that two more times, okay. and that's the. Yeah. yeah with... <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it seemed to work well with this many people. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't bad. I think it was just more terrible. confusing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I wasn't really playing to win. It was just... Yeah, but well, I try... was. That's why. <laughs> we're... we're feeling tired. tired. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of caffeine tomorrow morning. Yes. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Jasmine, hi Pete. Thank you guys for coming back to Tabletop Deathmatch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Can you introduce your game and uh, kind of give us the, the very brief elevator pitch for it? This is our game Night Shift. Uh, and in Night Shift, players take the role of squires who are uh, battling it out to be the best squire, the top squire. It takes uh, two to six players, plays in half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, it's just a fun, fast-paced, uh, gateway game, filler game, just something fun. Let me introduce you to your judges who are going to be playing your game today. We have Paul Peterson, creator of Smash Up, Annalisa Delfell, the retail manager of Card Kingdom, Rodney Thompson, designer for Dungeons & Dragons, Mike Selinker, creator of Pathfinder Adventure Card Game, Luke Crane, creator of Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard, and Sherry Spiro, the founder of Ad Magic. All right, let's have you guys come over and set the game up and we'll play it through. Guys, the game looks amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about the design process and just getting the prototype to this uh, place that it's in now? We uh, decided that we wanted to go a little bit different with our medieval game because a lot of it is kind of done, you know, on scrolls and kind of this. Or sort of cartoony, like, uh, you know, like Munchkin. Yeah, mm. yeah, so we decided to go, we're calling it a medieval modern. We wanted to do really fresh, bright. Yeah. What was it like working with, with Ade? It looks like I, I see a lot of his like voice in the design here. It was amazing. Great. He's yeah. so good. <laughs> he made this look even better than we thought it was going to. So. Who picked the, the kind of purple accent color? <laughs> that was me. That was Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, get out of the way, and I'm going to let the judges uh, play through the game, and we'll see what they think. Pete's dealing out a hand of four cards. We're going to start with these, but don't get too attached to them. And, yes, uh, this is a drafting game. Drafting is a way for all of the players to decide what cards they're going to start with. Each player takes one card at a time, then passes the remaining options on to the next player until all the cards have been distributed amongst all the players. Each knight has an equipment pile. Uh, most of the cards in the knight's equipment pile will wind up being face down, courtesy of you guys. When it's your turn, you will have your choice of doing one of three things. You can play, you can peek and play, or you can claim a knight. I like the basic simplicity of the turn. The idea that you just draw a card, play a card, or peek and play, that's pretty great actually. Now you'll notice all the knights have uh, on the left a set of equipment that they are really uh, most interested in. If you can get them a complete set of that equipment, you get the listed bonus points. And the red banner is the item, or in Sir Josephine's case, items, that they dislike. For every item they dislike, they will lose five points for whichever squire takes them. I really like the design of the game. I think they need to make some adjustments with the color, but other than that, it was a gorgeous game. All right, so if you'd like to start us off, draw a card. Is, is Paul like first player the whole game? Yeah. No. Whoever wins a round becomes first squire for the next round. 
Got it. I really like the hidden information aspect of this game, and then there was a nice surprise at the end when the information was revealed. So here's my question. I played that face up. Mm -hmm. Now can no one effectively peek at that stack? Right. Right. Oh, this is somebody, locked? You can't peek at this card because it's no longer on top. But if somebody places a face down card on top of that lance, absolutely you can yeah. peek at that. I'm not going to lie to you. I felt like the amount of information that was there was way higher than it absolutely needed to be. I'm claiming the second knight. Okay. Do I still draw a card? Yes, you do. Okay, and what do I, now I need to get down back down to three. Uh, yes, discard. Just, oh, okay. Yeah. We tried it where you just don't draw, but um, then there's what one more card. What fun is that? <laughs> you can't look until the end. No, I'm with that much <laughs> So now that's it for him with the knight, but he can foil everyone else. Yes. Still play cards. <laughs> Sherry will hand him a stack of cards, one of which he will be able to use to destroy somebody else. <laughs> like, if he doesn't know what it is, but he'll use it, he'll see one in here. Exactly. Paul Peterson, yeah, good in lot. griefing. <laughs> griefing is an activity that takes place in certain board games where a player targets another player, intending to harm their efforts in that game. What is it that he hates? Oh. This guy? Traveling gear. Oh, okay. <laughs> Paul was, Paul was making sure we all knew uh. <laughs> that he didn't know. Oh no, I just played a card at random on that night. <laughs> I really like during the scoring you reveal that somebody has done the griefer aspect of the game when after they've already taken theirs and it's a surprise. Well, I'm tired of not having a night. So <laughs> I'm getting this one. Give me that one. Uh, Sir Brutus. All right, and discard all your cards at this point. Let me ask you a question. Does that one still count for what, who's the drunkest? No. Oh. oh, nobody told me no, that. No, no, that's a, that, that, no I wanted to get that cleared that. because, it, I wanted to get that cleared because uh. you were taking it, that, that, got, that you now almost certainly have the most drunk night. I'm not even gonna, <laughs> not even gonna look at my cards. Uh. Sorry for not clarifying <laughs> that. Okay. It actually did used to be the case. Yeah, we did, we used to play it that way, but, um, <laughs> It was too confusing. <laughs> so turn over your gear, see what Santa Squire brought you. And can anyone beat three booze? Oh no, no one can. <laughs> no. <laughs> what bothered me about this, you know, our particular presentation was the way they kept making excuses for their design. And they kept uh, trying to hedge criticisms by saying, oh, it was like this, but we th thought we should do this, but now we're really doing this. And, you know, just kind of over explaining everything rather than just letting the game speak for itself. Um, so we're going to start with most booze. Oh, so. I'm totally drunk. That's right. That's <laughs> so right. you are out of this round. Yes. <laughs> Probably for the past. Probably. <laughs> okay. I think it's a mess. I mean, I think there's a lot here that's promising, and I think by the time they're done with it, I think it'll be a pretty good game, but it's not a good game now. Okay, and from this point forward, when we score something, you can discard it. It won't score further, so toss That's, the is that, wait, is that true? Do I, I still might tie for the most or? Yeah, they, they, can't, they can't get positive points off. That's another rule we're considering changing. That we thought it would be confusing if you dislike something and then score normally, but it seems like the reverse is true. It seems like uh, as we've been playtesting this version this weekend, it seems like more people are confused by you don't score something you dislike. I thought you and subtract you points when you don't when you dislike something. You yeah. do, right? And we. But the question uh, is whether that like. Yeah, or whether it pairs with other things could be important. And yeah, you know, like exactly. if you lose it now, if it's a lance, for example, yeah. and you also have the horse, right. now you, you lose your bonus yeah. for having the horse. Yeah, and I think, and yeah, that seems to throw people and it also seems to restrict strategy a little, so that's definitely a rule we're, we're probably going to... Okay, but we'll play it as, as written for now, so... Sherry, this like sword. Okay, so negative five there. Right. So I lose my pair of yeah. my sword That's what I'm shield. saying, it's yeah. exactly that, exactly. yeah. The rules were kind of unclear, but maybe it's just because it was the first time that we were hearing them. Not crazy about that rule, just saying. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to go and we want to look at the scoring in particular again because of this issue. I definitely think that some of the scoring mechanism is flawed. That's my personal opinion. You know, I, I worked hard to get the sword and the shield and I got no points for that at the end. So during your playtesting, mm -hmm. How much of an issue did you have with players uh, experiencing analysis paralysis? Because, the, I mean, you described it earlier as a sort of light, casual, fun mm -hmm. game, um, but my my primitive gamer brain needs to understand everything that's happening at all times, and I uh, there's a lot of variability going on all over the place, right? I mean, these two cards pair together well. These, I need to match everything the same. Like, the companions have to all be the same. How much of an issue did you have with people slowing down to make, like, the best possible decision? So I think the 
first round usually takes the longest as people kind of get used to the cards and the odds mm -hmm. and the combination. I don't think they understand the impact of how drafting and complex hidden information makes players just lock up. And we just spend our time staring at the board trying to figure out what to do instead of just playing and enjoying what we were doing. There is actually a very large amount of information in play at any given time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so much of it is hidden and I have to keep the, all that in my head you know, for seven different characters. Not to mention the fact that I'm also having to remember what cards I had in my hand, where those cards are now around the way. Also, who played what on which one? I mean, there is actually a lot uh, going on in this game. Uh, so I think the, the thing that we were trying to do was make something that would be accessible to people who don't game, but then still compelling for people who do. Sure. I think the drafting mechanic might be completely unnecessary, and I also think the order of operations on your turn could be improved and it would make a much better game. The, the argument you just made, I, I feel like, well, yeah, this game should play much slower than it actually does. <laughs> but um, the thing is, in practice, um, it really hasn't been that much of an issue. It does tend to play relatively have you quickly. Been, have you been present at all the playtests? Uh, yes. So um, far. We have it up on our website. As a print and play, but haven't had any takers for the blind play test yet. Can you, can you summarize what our point totals were at the end? Yeah. Uh, so we have um, Paul with eight, um, Annalisa with four, Rodney with negative one, Mike has zero for oh, the I round. Oh, I beat Rodney. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Luke has five and Sherry has one. All right, we're going to uh, kick you guys out and hold on to your prototype for a few minutes so we can have a discussion about the game. Okay. <sighs> Uh, that went well. That went well. Yeah, um, I thought they had a lot of uh, really valid um, criticisms, but fortunately I think it was some things that we'd already considered ourselves. And yeah. I think that they liked the braininess of it, but felt that it was at odds with our pitch. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I can see the point. It's not a super, super light game. It's. I think it, um, I mean, it I really think it's depends accessible. on your, your players. That is what we were going for. We wanted something that was accessible, yeah. but still had some depth to right. it. exactly. So, I mean, mark it. <laughs> We did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, judges, what did you guys think of the game? I don't think it's even close to done. Like, um, I think I, I don't think they've even played it more than more than twenty times. I and that's, I'm kind really of disagree. I actually kind of I liked it. I have a problem with games like this in that I look at them when they're unfinished, like this one seems to be, and I automatically fix them, and then I judge it based on the game that it could be and not the game that it is. I think Paul kind of gave the game a little bit of a pass based on the potential that it has, but right now, for a new player, especially for one looking for a casual game, there's just no way I would put that out in front of them. This game is so in the midpoint of their testing process. Like, the, the, the design that, that was done on it looks great, Right. But uh, this felt like a play test. Even the designers were saying, yes, we were thinking of changing that. When you're confident about a game, when you've played it a bunch of times, your response is, well, actually, it doesn't work that Mike, way. Mike, I've, right. I've made games that I've play tested 10,000 times. And if I sat next to celebrity game designer Mike Selinker, creator of the yeah. Pathfinder yeah. exactly. Adventure That's card true. game, and he said, did you ever think of this mechanic? I, I'd go, well, that's a great idea. I'm with Mike on this one. They, they were hemming and hawing their way through the whole thing. Like, well, we, kinda, we thought of it could be this, but it might be this, and, but it's this right now. We're thinking about other things. Absolutely no way to approach this. I don't care who's sitting there. I did like how it was so sorry, it's so easy to start playing, but like everybody mentioned, um, once you begin laying down cards, you realize all the information you're missing. I think it's a fair critique that there's a lot of information in the game, but I also think they did um, a really brilliant job organizing the information on the cards and letting you kind of model the whole thing out. So I wasn't as worried about that as the other judges. There is a huge, huge amount of information at any given time, and that, like all the different scoring methods, what cards are where, who has passed what, where everything is in the round. I see a lot of promise here. I don't. I, yes. I came down like a ton of bricks, and I should go sort of roll that back. Um, there's a good game that can be made with the concept of a line of knights who care about certain things and don't like other things and and such. I mean, I just feel like we walked into the middle of their development process rather than anywhere near the end of it. To me, I think the biggest problem with this game is just the pitch. Um, I don't think this game should be pitched as like a casual light party game. I think they should just go ahead and pitch this as a strategy game and that's going to set expectations for what's actually in the box.
It sounds like maybe there's an issue with this game being like sort of uncomfortably in the middle of a more advanced game for people who can add up all the math and want to commit to a play and a more casual game where people just want to jump in. Yeah, and I can see you can jump into this game blindly, but you just don't know what you're doing. So there's a lot of information I think to absorb before you're going to be good at it. Um, however, I can see this game being played in a pub um, at a big booth with like four people and having beers and playing this game. but. Um, I don't really see it going much beyond that. I don't think the person's going to take it home and break it out very often. I don't think it would sell, actually, um, just because I think that it's, it's something that people would borrow from our library, but I don't think that they'd come over to the cash register and actually purchase it. We played this, and I don't think we know at all about when to pick nights. Oh, absolutely not. No, I mean, look what happened here, right? Like, Mike misplayed, got all the booze, got zero points, and still didn't come in last in the round. Right? I still ended up with negative one point, right? I specifically enjoyed getting a better score than Mike Selinker and Rodney Thompson. I'll say for, for all the, the uh, alleged problems with this game, you seem pretty salty about losing to Mike. <laughs> I will say that I actually, actually thought that was one of the strengths of the game. That, like one of the values of the, the lack of information is the surprise during the scoring round, right? right. Which is kind of fun. But the fact that, the fact that like, we didn't really know what was coming during the scoring round was kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's okay, right? But the end result yeah, of end result. you clearly misplayed because you didn't know the rules. I thought I knew the rules and was making ostensibly informed decisions and I still end up with negative one points. Table flip. Well, I liked Rodney's points. I think that players will go up the learning curve a little bit and they will get used to the amount of information that there is and it won't take quite so long to process it. Sherry, you got a chance to read the rules. Did you did you take anything away from that? Are they well written? I mean, it looks like a pretty concise little rule book. I like the rule book and I think that the size of the cards, well, for me, uh, I, I, I had a hard time seeing these things, but I, I like the fact that it's a bigger card. And manufacturing-wise, not an expensive game to make. I think the icons are too small the point values were impossible to read, so I, I did not like that. The color purple that they chose for their cards um, just made it difficult to discern the little badges on the cards that had the point differentials in them. I do want to say one thing in favor of this game is I think it has a decent amount of, uh, once they get all the problems worked out, a decent amount of replayability just by the random draw, like you only use a subset of the cards. That That is something that I think is really important in, in games that you want to hit the table an awful lot is getting that different experience every time. All right, well, let's uh, get the designers back in here and let them know how they did. Guys, thank you so much for showing the game. We were all incredibly impressed with the design, and we thought you did a really good job managing um, Ade's work and managing the design resources. This is a beautiful prototype. Thank you. And we really liked the uh, hidden information aspect of the face-down cards and the surprise that comes when you go to scoring and you finally look at what you have. But we didn't think you really fully grasp the amount of information that players are dealing with at any given time. We also think there's a pretty steep learning curve for new players given the massive amount of information they're dealing with. We kind of felt like we'd walked in on the middle of your design process and that you still have a lot of development to go and it could be very different when it came out to the public, uh, but we think that it'll be very promising when it gets there. We'll see you guys back here for our final judging. All right, so thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, uh, good. good, yeah, I think they had a very valid point, which is that you know, we know we need to rework the scoring uh, kind of one more time. The feedback the judges gave us, I'm wondering if we do need to reconsider presenting it as an entry level game. Plays fairly easily, you don't. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we should not emphasize that and let that be a pleasant surprise yes. of, oh, hey, this game is actually really easy to play. And <laughs> that might be a better way to position it yeah, market wise. Yeah.